So I'm uh, uh, very happy to introduce Nick Roy, who is a new member of CBMM. And uh, Nick is also professor in the Department of Aeronautic Astronautics and is a member of CSAIL and a director of the bridge part of the quest for intelligence. So um, the Nick is one of the main representatives of robotics research at MIT. He has done great and amazing things and he will describe some of them to us today. And at CBMM, we of course have the goal to um, have research in engineering, like in robotics, interact and be inspired and inspire work in neuroscience and cognitive science. So I'm looking forward to this talk and to a lot of inspiration. Nick. Thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, it's a pleasure both to be part of CBMM and also to be giving a, a talk today. Um, and uh, as Tommy said, I'm gonna talk about a few of the different things and I'm also gonna try and relate them to questions that I don't know the answers to that perhaps you all can help me figure out the answers to in terms of how natural intelligence exhibits some pretty phenomenal capabilities that seem to be important to, to robots. And, and uh, Chris mentioned the uh, questions. I'm happy to take questions during the talk. I do have the um, Q and A window open, um, but Chris, you know, please also, if you see me uh, steamrolling through a question, uh, please feel free to interrupt me so I can take it. Um, so it, it's a super exciting time to be working in with robots and autonomous vehicles, et cetera. Um, you know, when I first started at MIT in 2003, you, robots simply were not something that you saw as part of your everyday life. But of course, now we have self-driving cars that are you know, present in Boston, certainly all over the place in the Bay Area, Singapore and other places. Um, on the right, you see an autonomous drone delivery happening. This is part of a project that I led at Google uh, a few years ago. And so, you know, we, we're not just seeing robots uh, being tested and evaluated in the real world. We're actually seeing them become part of our everyday life. You know, we're taking the services that they promise to uh, offer, all, starting to almost take them for granted, which is super exciting for me um, as, as somebody who wants to develop these systems and extend what they can do and understand what we need uh, to develop further in terms of the technology to uh, give us even better vehicles. To understand what we need to do next, it's useful to ask, how did we get here? So what's enabled current autonomy capabilities? So a few things, one is small uh, computers. Um, when I was a graduate student many years ago, the total amount of computation on the surface of the earth was less than what's in the human brain. And of course, you know, it's many, thanks to Moore's law, that we're surpassed many, many orders of magnitude relative to the human brain uh, in terms of what uh, exists on the surface of the earth. But also we can now get them in really small form factors, which is great for me as somebody developing small drones, for instance, we can put tremendous amounts of com computation inside these vehicles. Another is just small scale electronics of, of various kinds. Certainly the cell phone industry has given robots and drones, um, you know, uh, great enabling technologies. Another one is just a lot of the infrastructure we put up in the last uh, 25 years or so. So GPS, this is a GPS satellite. So GPS gives our systems the ability to know where they are. It gives them great, uh, um, uh, or the telecommunications also gives us a great ability to, to communicate between the vehicles. So these are all hugely uh, enabling. But I think most people in the field would agree that these have not been the biggest deals. The thing that's really given us the most progress has been the development of highly accurate lightweight sensors. One of the reasons why we can uh, recognize self-driving cars as they drive around is almost all of them have some kind of spinning LIDAR on top of, uh, that basically gives the vehicle the ability to see where obstacles are, recognize other cars driving around, and those LIDARs also work far better than GPS does for these vehicles to know where they are. So that the laser rangefinder in particular, many people have argued was the single biggest breakthrough for autonomous, certainly ground robots. On the right is another laser rangefinder. Um, this, uh, this is uh, made by Hakuya Automation. They thought they were making a factory safety LIDAR, um, but they were actually making a LIDAR for flying vehicles because this weighs only 160 grams. It's about yay big if you can see my screen. And it uh, lets us do things like this. So this is a video from a few years ago from my research group. Uh, we put a LIDAR on this uh, aircraft and had it fly around in the state of parking garage. And 
in some sense, this is just kind of a stupid robot trick. Uh, we showed what could be done with autonomous uh, flight. Um, and but the reason I like this video is besides the fact it's kind of fun to look at and it was fun that we could do it. Um, it also uh, is not a, tr a flight that a human pilot could have flown. This is not to say that human pilots can't do this. Human pilots are extremely good. Um, but the interesting thing is there's no place for a human person pilot to stand um, so that they can actually see the vehicle all the way through the flight. So if you want to keep the vehicle safe, you puts a lot of pressure on the onboard sensing um, in order for the vehicle to know where it is and make appropriate uh, control decisions. Now, LIDARs have been great for um, uh, self-driving cars, but they're not especially biologically motivated. Um, they, you know, there are animals that have like echolocation, bats, uh, dolphins, uh, et cetera. Um, projected light tends to not be something that uh, biology has, has done a lot of. Um, the same students who uh, put this vehicle into the air uh, went off to found a startup called Skydio, which some of you uh, may have heard of in full disclosure. I'm an advisor to the company. So they uh, realized the limitations of LIDAR and have really focused on uh, computer vision for enabling the same kind of uh, flights. So the intended application is among other things, um, a civilian uh, infrastructure inspection. So this is uh, the Skydio vehicle inspecting a bridge, uh, I forget, where the bridge is exactly. I think it might be Minneapolis. Um, but this is an extremely difficult operation for a human pilot, again, to carry out because they don't have situational awareness where they're normally standing. So this is entirely GPS denied. It's building a model of the bridge structure, and it has some understanding of the kinds of operations that the human pilot wants in order to actually uh, fly around. It can fly you know, through really complicated and tight spaces, including this very, very narrow structure. And the way that it works is it uses the navigation cameras, the six of them, uh, and I'll show a better picture in a second, to basically build a 3D map of the environment and uh, navigate through that. And here's another uh, video of uh, the Skydio vehicle flying at relatively high speed, um, building this three-dimensional map. The uh, voxels are false color, color by distance. And um, it does this all in real time entirely on board the vehicle. So. Uh, this is all preamble by way of saying that computer vision, so uh, LIDAR and sensing really got autonomous vehicles up and running. Um, for, uh, first in uh, indoor robots and so-called service robots, and then on the ground self-driving car robots. And now computer vision really seems to be enabling aerial operations. So, so sensing uh, hugely important. But if computer vision seems to be crushing it right now, how come, we don't actually have more ubiquitous autonomy. Why don't we have robots in our houses and in our workplaces when we're in the workplaces? And, and why haven't the self-driving car uh, companies really delivered on, on the promise? And like, you know, uh, Waymo uh, went public in 2012, if I have that date correctly. So it's been eight years and they've driven millions and millions of miles, but they, they only operate in Arizona and, and, and the Bay Area. So, so why don't we have ubiquitous autonomy? And so the rest of this talk, I'm gonna try and give a few reasons uh, why we don't have ubiquitous autonomy and try and talk about some of the work that I and, and some others are doing to try and advance the state of the art. Um, but uh, here we go. So I made the point that the Skydio 2 vehicle um, you know, uh, is doing all these things, but it's using six navigation cameras. And as impressive as this vehicle is, it can, it, it can understand and it can process it as perception of the scene far less than what you or I could have with exactly one eye. You and I can, uh, can cover one eye and basically operate um, uh, just fine in the environment. We might have a little bit of difficulty catching a baseball um, that, you know, that, was, uh, that has traveled more than 10 or 15 meters. But other than that, we can do most things just fine. But the Skydio vehicle really has a tremendous pressure on its ability to have much, much better imaging than what, what you or I have. Um, and so uh, that suggests that there's something about how we're using the camera imagery that probably doesn't match what biology does. And that's possibly where some, some, some of those sorts of difficulty lies. Another issue is that if you compare the amount of computation on board the vehicle, it's an NVIDIA Tegra X2 and it's a 15 watt computer and it's maxed out. Um, if you talk to the Skydio folks, uh, they will tell you there's no, not much room for any additional computation beyond what they're doing. And if you compare that to the adult brain and uh, sidebar, it's interesting that certainly 
the internet and the popular literature has very little consensus on what how much power the adult brain actually consumes. I thought it was about 20 watts. I thought I learned that from Jim DiCarlo. But if you go and ask, you know, even the literature, um, you get widely different answers. I think, you know, a doubling of possible power is, is wildly different. It was interesting. There was also Jeff Bezos has been on the record multiple times saying the human brain consumes 60 watts, which I'm pretty sure is not right. Um, so it, it is interesting to me. I couldn't find a definitive uh, source that, you know, unequivocally define how much power Power the brain consumes, probably people's brains uh, vary, might be a source of the issue. But if somebody has a reference for this, I would be grateful. Um, but the point is, is that the NVIDIA uh, computer is about as powerful as the human brain, but is producing far less uh, capability out of that power. And so the question is like, why is it so badly misusing its computation? So what's going on? So it's worthwhile looking at the, the structure of an autonomous system, a control structure. And some of you may have heard me talk about this in, in, a, in a program review before. But you know, there's parts of these vehicles that work really well and parts that don't. And the parts that really work, so if we look at the control structure, you'll notice that pretty much every single deployed and operational vehicle uh, has a low level control loop that looks something like this. You have sensor data that comes in, it goes into some kind of probabilistic estimator like a common filter or something that it says where the vehicle is in space and also it might say what's around it. So you might have just a position estimator, you might have a mapping solution. That uh, position estimate gets fed to a motion planner that generates a reference trajectory that gets fed to a controller um, that uh, then generates action commands to the motors. And it runs at a fast duty cycle at about a thousand hertz usually. Now, this is fine, but it isn't really good for anything except getting the vehicle from point A to point B. So if you want to do a more complicated mission, more complicated task of some kind, then there's almost always a thing sitting on top of this control architecture that's very symbolic, which is a very ill-defined term. It's very discreet. And it extracts some notion of the state estimate in a symbolic representation, a discrete representation of the state estimate, such as I'm, I'm not at a XY position in the world, but like I'm on a road, a distinct road, or if I'm an indoor robot, I'm in this room or that room. And then some symbolic uh, planner uh, operates in order to figure out what the high level sort of sub goal for the should be given to the motion planner, like drive to the end of the road or exit the room or something like that. And then this uh, uh, that gets converted into a low level motion plan and so on. And this is reasoning over many more things typically than the lower level. And so, it, but it, good news is it can run at a slower duty cycle. And what you see in almost every operational autonomous vehicle of one kind or another is that this lower level thing works really well. Very, very unusual for failure in the system to result from failure in state estimator, failure in motion planner. Almost always a result of the vehicle being in some kind of uh, operational condition that wasn't uh, expected or some kind of mechanical or electrical failure. What does fail is this. This relationship between the low level control of the robot and the higher level reasoning of what the robot's supposed to be doing almost always ends up with the robot getting stuck or not knowing what to do or doing the wrong thing. So this is where the failures in autonomy come from. This is why we don't have these highly capable robots around us right now. So, so why is it, what is it about this thing that breaks? It's not really this upper level, high level reasoning piece that breaks. It's the relationship between the two. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm gonna call, notice I have these little arrows that represent information or control flow. And these little arrows typically represent uh, information control flow condition on some kind of model. So I need to figure out how my sensor behaves in order to make a state estimate. I have to figure out how my plant behaves in order to give reasonable control signals. Those, those uh, estimates of how the sensor, the plant behaves, those models, everywhere that I can learn that model from data, I'm going to color it in green. Um, you know, we have techniques like state estimation. Um, uh, or maybe you have reinforcement learning that's basically describing how uh, to pick good symbolic actions based on some kind of symbolic state. And this, this notice that every arrow down here is colored in green. That's, I can learn basically everything I need to know about the low level operation of my robot from data. But I can't color every arrow in green. These two arrows here are in red. And the reason they're in red is because I can't learn them from data. And inevitably what happens is that I get some engineer or some graduate student to write down a set of symbolic states, some rules for how to extract them from the state estimate, some rules for what my symbolic actions are, like my behaviors, for instance, given to the motion planner. And they're writing it down in, in Python or C++ or, or something. 
And inevitably, the, the engineer or the grad student forgets uh, some edge cases or fails to account for some combination of conditions or somehow doesn't capture the richness of the problem. The robot breaks. People get a bit frustrated. They come along. They extend the finite state machine with extra states or extra transitions, and they keep uh, uh, operation resumes. And essentially, we keep going until the next failure happens. And essentially, you're doing like AI or machine learning by grad student. And that's not as scalable. Um, just to make this super concrete, you know, this is not an artificial example. Imagine that you're a delivery drone uh, company, like I was running a delivery drone project at, at Google. And you might have a very simple sequence for uh, delivering a package, take off, fly to destination address, enter hover, lower winch, et cetera. Very simple. You're up in, you know, you're in part of this airspace where you're not going to encounter other aircraft. There's no contingencies you have to worry about. Let's take one of these symbolic uh, sequences, fly to destination address. You're a large internet company that happens to be developing this uh, drone. So you actually happen to, you know, your drone doesn't know about addresses. It knows about GPS, but you've also got a large street view uh, a unit that's uh, collecting street addresses and mapping the GPS coordinates. So why don't you ask your street view unit? What is the mapping between addresses we're doing delivery and GPS locations for delivery? So this is an address in Palo Alto. You look up the GPS location and it's there. This is a great statement of where that house is for that address. It is a singularly poor location for where to deliver packages. Your vehicle has to understand that that's not, this is a bad thing to do. Okay, well, maybe you're actually smarter than that and you also happen to have a self-driving car unit and so you ask the self-driving car unit, where would you put the car? Well, that's here on the street, another really bad place to deliver packages. Okay, maybe you've got somebody who's going like figuring out where, so the nearest sidewalk access is. That's here, it's under a tree. You can't deliver that either. You might actually want to deliver in the backyard, except maybe there are kids playing there. So I lied a little bit when I said there were no contingencies. Pretty much every operate every step of operating an autonomous vehicle of some kind requires understanding constantly what's happening in the environment around you. The, the models that we tend to operate with uh, our autonomous vehicles right now are so abstract that they really don't represent the real world. And so my claim is that this, one of the things that's really holding back true autonomy is that it requires true understanding of the environment. And what do I mean by understanding of the environment? Um, another thing that I've, I've talked about in, in a program review before that some of you may have seen me mention is that this is really a question of how do we represent the environment? If you went back in time uh, many years ago to a robotics conference that says like the late seventies or early eighties, um, well, First of all, you couldn't. There were no robotics conferences in the 70s or 80s. All of robotics was inside AI. And AI was all about logic. This is Rene Descartes, the father of logic. And people were spending a huge amount of time writing down facts about how the world worked in order to get to what they thought. That was the thing that they uh, thought was important for AI. Um, and it turned out that logic was not a great way to represent the world because uh, you had a trouble with uh, reconciling inconsistent pieces of sensor information. Um, if my claim is that the sensor was the thing that really enabled robotics, then logic was poorly suited and has been poorly suited for deal handling the errors, the inconsistencies, and the partial observability that comes out of real sensors. And robotics eventually moved to probability theory. This is the Reverend Thomas Bayes. And probability was not well thought of, uh, but it was a roboticist, a guy by the name of Peter Cheeseman, who wrote in defense of probability that really argued that if you wanted to deal with the real world, then you needed to be able to, you needed probabilistic models that allowed us to represent uh, the real world. And so robotics actually, you know, these, these kinds of models were all about what robot was, or what robotics was all about for many years. And you never, really never see models like this in robotics conferences anymore. You see probability distributions over and over and over again, because they are how you deal with reconciling ins inconsistent pieces of the real world. So that was a representational shift. So the question then is, how do we, what are the right representations? How do we actually get to identifying the right representations for operation in, in the real world? So let's turn back to computer vision again. Uh, many of you, you know, I'm sure have read the Forsyth and Pons book and uh, David Forsyth in 96 observed that the world consisted of things and stuff. So I made the claim a few minutes ago that uh, computer vision seems to be crushing it. Computer vision is, I don't want to take anything away from computer vision. They've done a remarkable job at giving us tools that work really well in, in, in a lot of ways. But I would say that right now, computer vision is the best at object recognition. 
we could argue about whether it's, it's the best of this, but it is pretty good at object recognition. You can go to vision.google.com and give it an image and it will label 5,000 different categories of things with very, very high precision. And many of you may have even better performance on, on a lot of these things. And I'm gonna observe that certainly knowing where cars and, and other distinct objects are in the world are, but objects aren't necessarily the most useful thing for an embodied system. The things that might actually be more useful are the stuff in the world, stuff that aren't distinct locations of point objects in the world, but spatially extended uh, you know, trees that, that deform and move around um, that really exist over not just a point in space, but an extent of space. Even better than trees is being ext uh, extract the roads. So one of the things that I'd like to observe is that as we think about what are the representations that we need for true robots and embodied intelligence, actually incorporating a model of the stuff in the world is, is a, a crucial representational ability for acting uh, in the world. But again, simply extracting the, um, so we could, you know, semantic segmentation has, uh, you know, Done remarkably well in the last uh, few years. Um, you can actually get semantic segmentation to run, do up to 60 classes, you know, using uh, less than 20% of a, a 1080 um, at 15 hertz. Can't quite get that onto a drone, but you can get about five hertz um, with fewer classes on a drone, which is pretty good. Um, and so we actually uh, did this, is that we put semantic segmentation on our drone. And the first thing, uh, uh, we're using an RGB D camera, so an Intel RealSense. And, so, and the first thing to notice is that if we just rely on the ranging ability of the depth camera, we can't see very far. We only see 10 meters maximum range. If we start to extract semantic segmentations from the RGB camera image, we can do a lot better in terms of understanding the scene around us. And we're getting you know, great uh, sort of dense fill-in of the environment around us. We can identify the roads, uh, which uh, for a drone flying in an unknown environment are a great signal of what are good uh, trajectories in the environment. The, um, the other thing is, is that uh, by having partial depth, we can actually recover the depth of the, those semantic segmentation pieces and actually build a three-dimensional model of the environment. But reasoning about that three-dimensional model of the environment is, is complicated from a planning perspective. So uh, we also sparsify it, as you see here. Um, so what we do is we take the road segments and we do a, a graph retraction. And then uh, we can actually use that to fly through the environment at uh, uh, relatively high speeds. Here, the vehicle is going nine meters per second as it flies through. This is a Medfield State Hospital out in Medfield. It's no longer used as a hospital, so it's a great place for us to go and fly. And doing relatively low um, uh, 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 frame rate semantic segmentation of the scene and then retracting to a, a graph network that the vehicle can fly around, um, all of a sudden we can get you know, very, very, uh, um, uh, very, very good motion. And we're using much less computational power than the Skydio vehicle. We obviously have much less detailed representation of the environment. And I would argue that this is not the right representation if we're doing the kind of very careful flight in and amongst the steel bars of a bridge that the Skydio vehicle was doing. But for fast uh, operation in outdoor environments, maybe hybrid representations may be extremely useful. And um, uh, uh, and, but what we really want to do is actually understand everything that's around, around the vehicle. So if true autonomy requires understanding everything that's around the vehicle, then I would love to understand how does the brain know what everything is around it um, at, at such low computational power? I don't have an answer, but I'm, you know, as, within CBM, I'd love to get uh, a better answer to that. Now, David Forsyth said that there were things and stuff. So we've talked about stuff. What about things? Things are a bit problematic for uh, uh, autonomous vehicles right now. So Again, object recognition, uh, object detection is, is a great technology, we have it on our vehicles, um, but it's not perfect. It's very good for recognizing the existence of an object on a flat 2D image. Um, but our robots and our vehicles exist in three dimensions. They need to not only that there is a car at roughly this part of the image, but we need, we need to know where it is, how far it is away, and how big it is for the purposes of, of safe operation around the vehicle. But that's hard, hard to do. Our object recognition is gonna get it wrong a lot of the time. Um, probably done a fine job with this car. It's got the bounding box right around this car and a couple more images would probably give us the ability to try uh, trilaterate um, on the position and, uh, no, sorry, triangulate on the position and trilaterate on the, uh, the size and distance. Um, probably gonna get this window wrong. This uh, uh, pillar here is occluding the window and it's definitely gonna get this window wrong here because the windows uh, run off the edge of the frame. So 
uh, that, that's problematic. You know, we often re represent objects as point estimates. We approximate the bounding box as a noisy point estimate. And so we sort of take multiple measurements as sort of the centroid of the bounding box that corresponds to the centroid of the object. And if we have occlusions, we're gonna get it wrong. So we need our perception system to be reasoning about not just you know, spatially extended stuff in the world, but we also need our perception system to be reasoning about spatially extended objects in the world. So we need to represent objects as 3D volumes. Now, we could represent them as discretized, voxelized objects, but there's a bunch of reasons why that's computationally not very efficient. And, and we know that we don't reason about the world in terms at the very low level sort of uh, voxelized representation of the world. We think about objects as a single, a lot of the time, bounding uh, solid. And so uh, an interesting bounding solid uh, might be an uh, ellipsoid. And so if we uh, reason about um, sort of the nature of the edges of the bounding box with respect to the bounding ellipsoid, we might do a much better job of fusing, uh, um, uh, fusing the bounding boxes. So why ellipsoids? Um, they're low dimensional. They uh, allow a smooth closed form update as we get uh, extra measurements. It turns out that the, the, there's, there's uh, two 500 uh, page uh, books written simply about understanding how uh, ellipsoids behave under uh, different um, measurements, et cetera. Really, uh, quadrics are really quite remarkable objects, but highly useful for reasoning about uh, low dimensional representations of, of space. There is one problem, is that we do have a problem of baseline. So we, if we restart, commit to, instead of reasoning about, uh, say, points of centers of objects from bounding boxes, and we start reasoning about ellipsoids instead, then uh, we need to make sure we have enough measurements to make sure we have a well-posed problem. If we don't have enough measurements to have a well-posed problem, then the following thing happens. Full disclosure, this is a simulation, uh, but we're getting it working on the air vehicle soon. Um, we're taking bounding boxes uh, of these objects and we are uh, doing um, data fusion for multiple views in order to extract ellipsoids that we then render here as uh, bounding cuboids. And you can see that a lot of the bounding cuboids actually don't fit the, um, uh, the ground truth, which is the dark gray uh, uh, cuboids there very well. Um, that oftentimes the ill posedness of the solution results in poor uh, um, uh, estimates. And poor estimates of the volume of free space around you is bad news for a vehicle because that's how you end up hitting things. Is you really wanna know where, um, uh, 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 we really wanna know where the objects are around you. So what do you do? Typically what you do is you become super conservative and you put very large bounding volumes around your estimates of these things. So you know there's something roughly there, but you don't exactly know where it is. You know uh, that, that there's, there's um, maybe there's a covariance attached. And so uh, you, you put a bounding uh, a cuboid around the covariance and, and, and um, you just give up on the fact that you don't have very good estimates. And so you can't maybe perhaps operate in, in certain regimes. But, but that, that seems sad that you uh, committed to this representation of space, but then you said, but I'm really bad at getting that representation of space. What, what can we do about it? Maybe the thing to do is to actually recognize that oops, you may have different ways of representing space. So maybe, you know, the first time you see an object, you're gonna get relatively ill-posed uh, Ill views of that object. And the best you can do is represent it as a this centroid of an object with some estimate of the overall, um, uh, overall uh, location. Um, but then maybe as you get more views, you get a much better estimate. And, and uh, I'm gonna play, go back there. If you watch the estimate of the potted plant, it actually transitions from a centroid to actually a volume around the potted plant. As we got more views, we're able to uh, change the representation of space uh, based on how much we know about the objects. And so we can actually have a hierarchy of different representations. We may have a very abstract representation initially, which is just, we know something's there. Um, there's a bounding patch, but we don't have. We can't even tell where it is in space. And as we get more measurements, we get a point mass representation. So we refine the representation, and then perhaps we actually get to spheres, ellipsoids, or bounding cuboids, as you show here, um, as we get more and more measurements. And so this is something that this kind of hierarchical hierarchical abstraction over representations is something that robotics just hasn't had um, for most of its existence. And I'm gonna claim it's crucial for, you know, really understanding uh, the scene ar around you. If I take the same uh, um, problem that I showed on the previous slide and have the vehicle actually um, uh, move between different representations, and I'm gonna pause here, 
what you see is the vehicle got some initial estimates of the centroids of these objects, but did not know how, how big they were or exactly where they were. So it actually put very large bounding spheres around these objects for the purposes of safe conservative flight. Whereas here, this vehicle that's committed to the one representation of ellipsoids, which again, we're drawing here as bounding cuboids, um, uh, it's got it wrong. And it's lucky that it didn't try and fly too close to this object because it would have been wrong. Over here, it knows it's wrong. And so it's not going to try and fly too close to those objects. But if I let the videos play a little longer, you see that we're populating the scene in a very conservative manner. And then as the vehicle turns around, oh, it actually already promoted that object there to something that it knows it understands well. And you can see that the estimate corresponds to ground truth very, very well. And so, uh, the point here is to say that two things. One is that for uh, perception of uh, the environment for a real robot, uh, we need a much better understanding of the environment than simply dense voxelized representations. We need to know what things are uh, and we need to know where they are in space. And this requires us reasoning about spatially extended things like where the road network is, and it requires us to reason about objects at multiple levels of representation for the purposes of putting them in the representation as accurately as possible and uh, planning safe, safe trajectories around uh, the environment. So this is something that I would love to understand is how does the brain reason at different levels of representation in order to actually capture everything that's around it? You, you know, when you don't have a lot of information, you have to be super conservative and say that all the stuff in that general area is gonna be obstacle and I'm not gonna go near it. Um, and then at the same time, if you um, uh, aren't, uh, at the same time as you get more information, you wanna refine that more and more and you need these hierarchical uh, representations that you can move up and down on. Okay, so I said the computer vision seemed to be crushing it right now maybe for the purposes of image understanding, but maybe not yet for the purposes of full uh, vision on a fully autonomous vehicle. Um, but I'm talking mostly about perception. What about planning? And uh, okay, what is, uh, let's try and think about what it means to have the same questions about planning. You know, the vehicle, typically for planning, we understand everything about the, um, uh, the what's what's in the model that the planner is using, but do we have the same issues of like hierarchical representations and what's in the model? So let's choose a really really a simple planning problem. I'm going to call this the ring world. Imagine that we have two robots that are constrained to move on a ring and can't move through each other. So I have an O robot and an R robot. And um, for those of you who know about configuration space, I've drawn the configuration space um, on the right here. This is basically um, so uh, theta R is the angle that the R robot can move around the ring and theta O is the angle that the O robot can move around the ring. And so any point in the space here corresponds to configuration of two robots. And the gray bar right here is, is where they must be in intersection and that's disallowed. So you can't have the robots in, in intersection. So you can't be in this sort of gray stripe down the middle. Okay, so suppose I wanna put the, uh, the robots into a particular conf desired configuration. Um, so I wanna have them switch places for instance. So this is a super easy motion planning problem. You, you, there's two, two solutions. One is that either the O robot moves this way and the R robot moves in the same direction and swoops all around. And that corresponds to a path in configuration space that looks roughly like this. Um, you know, uh, the theta R robot takes a long way around and the O robot takes sh the short way around. Um, and you could give this to any motion planning problem. They might find the other solution, which is for the O ro both robots to go the other way. The O robot would go up and then wrap around and the R robot would, would move a little bit. Um, it, but either solution is fine. And you can give this to like a random sampling, uh, rapidly exploring random tree uh, planner, which you see on the left here. Um, Sertash Karaman and Emilio Frizzoli and Air Astro found an op optimal motion planning algorithm called the RT star some years ago. That's shown here and it finds the, the path there. That's great. Simple, simple planning problem, uh, unrelated to anything I've been talking about before. Now let's make the problem just a tiny little bit harder. Let's imagine that the R robot is a true robot and it can move around. But the O robot is actually an object and it can't move by itself. It can move when pushed, when the robots, uh, um, when the R robot is in contact and, and pushes it, but otherwise it can't. So now this is, this is the uh, optimal motion pl uh, plan here. You see the R robot only moving, data O is not changing. R robot moves around to come in contact with the O robot. Then it pushes 
the uh, uh, overall, but notice they both move down the plane of this sort of uh, 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 blocked part of the configuration space and then moves off again. Uh, that's the answer. This problem is almost completely unsolvable as a standalone motion plotting problem. And that's super weird. Why would that simple change make it almost impossible for most motion planning algorithms uh, to solve? Uh, you basically have to break it into two problems. One is where you figure out how to put the, the robot in contact with the object. You figure out how to move the two of them together. And then you figure out how to put the uh, robot uh, into the final configuration. You break it into three separate motion planning problems. And so this is basically the field of task and, and motion planning. And, and the reason why this is uh, complicated is that there are three analytic dynamical systems. There are three places where the dynamics of the system are smooth, um, but they're smooth in different ways. So you can have, you have a patch where the, um, uh, our, our, the uh, robot is not in contact. It's free to move around. Oh, it's the middle one here, excuse me. It's free to move around in this orange space. And it can only move on horizontal stripes because it can't move the object while it's not in contact. And then there's two other modes of operation. Uh, one where the robot is on one side of the object and pushing it, and they're both free to move in concert up and down this uh, uh, line. And the one is where the robot and object are in, uh, in contact on the other side of the object, and they're free to move up and down this line. And uh, What's tricky for motion planning algorithms is finding the transitions between these different modes. That uh, notice that we only have transitions between these modes when the uh, robot actually comes in contact. And that state of being in contact is a subset of measure zero if you're say sampling random states. And so finding a subset of measure zero is uh, essentially, you know, uh, it, it, it can be vanishingly improbable. To the, and that's what makes this problem so hard. So uh, only some of the state variables is, uh, can be controlled in each mode. Sampling from the orbits and the intersection between orbits, that's what you need in order to find solutions. And so by actually modeling the dynamic discontinuities, this is now trivially solvable as a stand standalone motion planning problem. So I made the case that for perception, we needed representational ability to represent a spatially extended uh, parts of the environment around us. And we needed to represent spatially extended objects around us. Now I'm making the case very briefly that to represent planning problems, we need to represent, uh, we need to represent these very rare, these very sparse um, uh, intersections between dynamic modes of the things in our environment. So we have two representational challenges. We have to represent everything around us. We have to um, uh, represent, be able to represent spatial ex extent. We have to have a hierarchy. And we have to find these very rare uh, places where the dynamic modes of our interaction with the environment change. And that's really, really hard to do. At least roboticists haven't figured it out. Um, this is another example here of a robot um, oops, uh, planning a, a task of actually moving these um, objects from one location to another. Um, this is another task in motion planning uh, problem. We're not doing anything particularly fancy here. But what happens when the robot is presented with an extra tray? All of a sudden, the planning problem changes dramatically in terms of the fact that it can actually do the planning, uh, uh, solve the problem a lot faster by actually using the objects in order to um, move the, uh, or use the tray in order to move the objects a, a lot faster. So think about what has to happen here is the uh, robot has to reason about the tray as a spatially extended object capable of supporting multiple objects. It has to reason about the uh, fact that there's discontinuities in the dynamics between the objects in uh, not in grasp of the robot manipulator, objects in grasp of the robot manipulator, objects in contact with the tray. Um, we figured out some of how to do this efficiently in terms of actually combining logical representations with um, uh, uh, with the geometry and the low-level continuous dynamics of, of the scene, but there's, there's a lot more uh, interesting research to be done here. Um, so uh, a question then I ask is like, how does the brain, maybe the, I wrote use here, but maybe use is the wrong word or not sufficient. Maybe how does the brain find and use the very sparse representations that capture the, the changes in the dynamic modes as we interact with, with our environment? There, there seems to be something special about discontinuities in the world um, for the purposes of planning. Let me give you another example. 
So imagine that you're a robot faced with trying to get, you're standing in an unknown environment. Um, you can you can see what you see right here. And you're told to go to a goal that's like 100 meters away in the direction of the green dash arrow. And you know, one thing you could do is you could build, you know, you've got a fancy laser. You've got the Skydio um, uh, reasoning system, or maybe you have, you know, semantic segmentation that's extracting the, the corridor and the hallway, et, et cetera, and, and building you um, a map. But uh, at the end of the day, you've really only got two choices, two distinct choices. You can go down the hallway, or you can go down the, um, uh, or you can enter the, into the classroom. And thinking about the environment as anything other than those two choices is computationally really demanding. So sparsity and, and discontinuity seem to be really important for driving down the computational cost of a lot of our planning algorithms. And oh, by the way, knowing the fact that the goal is 100 meters away is super useful for choosing between these two actions. Um, you know, if it's 100 meters away, it's unlikely to be inside this classroom because classrooms are not 100 meters across. It's much more likely that you're going to go down this corridor and there's probably another corridor at the end that you should maybe turn left at in order to, to go there. So we can use a lot of prior information to reason about these two distinct choices. If you really were reasoning at the level of like, you know, optimized trajectories through this environment, very hard to use that information in order to make decisions. And if I tell you the goal is five meters away, then you can still make, draw the same conclusions. It's pretty likely the goal is inside that classroom and not at the, uh, not, not inside uh, the corridor. Going down the corridor doesn't make any sense at all. So how do you actually get at these distinct choices that you might um, uh, reason about? So uh, there was some work about 15 years ago by a guy called Steve Laval at uh, UIUC, uh, where he built a thing called gap tree navigation. He demonstrated that if you had a robot that had a perfect sensor for sensing the discontinuities and range around the robot, you could actually build a navigation strategy that had some nice properties in terms of completeness and optimality. Um, not a very practical thing, but the key idea of actually sensing the, the range discontinuities around the robot actually turns out to be really, really useful for building representations that allow us to plan efficient trajectories through the environment. So this is simulation, but we actually trained a gap sensor for image data and put it on a real robot. And this is our little RC car driving around uh, the lobby. I think this is of the Sun School, uh, E50 or E51, I forget. And what you're seeing right below it is it's actually building a map by basically putting walls in between uh, the gaps that it sees in the range uh, from the camera. It's doing a little bit more inference than that because it's also reasoning about the, the whether the vertices that, that constitute the gaps are convex or concave and whether that constitutes a, a, a wall or not. But um, we actually uh, do a pretty good job of building a uh, representation of the environment that's very, very efficient, very, very compact, and is built entirely on this notion of discontinuities, not in the dynamics of the environment, but discontinuities in the geometric properties of the, of the um, environment. And, uh, you know, if you can uh, connect that with some of the ideas that I mentioned when we were looking at the classroom and the corridors, you can actually make reasonable guesses about whether to follow a, you know, a particular branch in uh, the range discontinuity. So this is an optimistic planner that's building a detailed map here and it's basically trying to get to some goal down here. Um, and then if we actually train a system to classify you know, gaps as to whether or not they're likely to make progress towards the goal or not, we can put that on a robot. And um, uh, you see here that it does a much better job of actually getting to the goal without being distracted by um, you know, uh, uh, parts of the environment that, that are unlikely to correspond to, to things that the uh, robot would use. Um, so uh, I'm going to say that true autonomy will require um, true understanding of the um, environment. Uh, brain needs to know everything around it, needs to reason at different levels of representation, and it needs to use very sparse representations, as, especially for um, decision making. Now, a, a lot of the systems that contain a learning component are, are increasingly important for complex autonomy. Um, and, and this is a problem for robotics because uh, um, learning models need a lot of data from all operating conditions. Lighting and weather changes, they're common in the real world. And you know, it's just data is very, very expensive for, um, for robots to gather. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip a few slides in the interest of time and just uh, assert that 
robots right now are as data hungry as the rest of our learning algorithms. Um, and the brain can learn from much from source corporate data that represent the real world very, very efficiently. I am by no means the first person to ask how the brain does this and, and you know, would absolutely um, uh, love to have an answer uh, to this because, you know, uh, my group right now is struggling with like, you know, data collection for, for robots. Um, uh, it's, you know, the, the bit I skipped is some work in Sim to Real, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. The, the other thing that really matters for robotics is, of course, uh, safety. So, learn, you know, we've seen uh, adversarial images. We've even seen adversarial objects. Um, we've seen a real failure uh, on in the Tesla autopilot where the, the system was presented with a, a white tractor trailer against the bright light sky that it had never seen before, did not recognize that as a tractor trailer, brake was not applied, and, and somebody died. And uh, one of the realities of learning in the real world that I I'm sure many of you, you know, very deeply appreciate, uh, as I do too, is that the real world is not IID. And so if you assume that the data is distributed like this, um, but it's actually distributed like this, a lot of our current learning models have a really hard time with this. And, and, and people like uh, Alexander Madri are doing, and others are doing great work in, in really trying to understand how we might trust our uh, representations and how we might trust our, our learned models. Um, uh, one thing that we have done is um, we've taken advantage of autoencoders to at least try and do anomaly detection. The idea here is that if, as you're training your gap detector or object recognition system, whatever, um, you also learn to reconstruct the input through something like the information bottleneck, then um, uh, we can actually recognize, you know, if the reconstruction is reasonably close to the input image, then you feel like you might have seen this before and you can trust your system. But if you um, haven't seen it, if it, the reconstruction is really terrible because this is a novel image that you've never seen before, then perhaps you shouldn't trust your learned system and you need to back off to something much more conservative. Um, I, I think this is just one step along the road and, and you know, other people have, have tr tried ideas like this before. Robotics doesn't really do a lot of this and, I, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, and I, I think the answer might be because it's really hard to know what actually makes an uh, image novel. This is from some work my student Charlie Richter did a few years ago. Um, and this is the basement of Stata. And he was actually driving a, a robot around and trying to have it predict trajectories using the autoencoder to determine when you couldn't trust uh, the input image or say the classification input image. And somebody stepped out of an open doorway here. And the system actually uh, characterized this as a novel image and didn't trust our prediction on it. But is this a novel image? You got most of the scene correct. Um, this is a person. Not knowing what to do when new people show, uh, show up seems like an important thing for safe operation in populated environments. But at the same time, the system was going to make an accurate prediction. So there's a complicated question to be asked and answered about what truly makes an image novel and when do we truly trust our, our systems? So uh, questions that I would love to know the answer to is, how do we represent everything around us? How do we do so in a hierarchical way? How does the brain use very sparse representations? How does it actually infer them from rich representations? How do we learn from sparse corpora? And how do we trust our own perception and, and, and our learned models? And I really think that we do need new mathematical theories of representation. They are, you know, theories of representation are very much, you know, uh, a hot topic right now. I don't want to pretend that I just discovered this. There's an entire conference on learned representations. But what I mean by representation, I think, is something very different. And I'm trying to articulate requirements on our representations that are imposed by robots and operating in the real world that give us, you know, more autonomy, that give us more complex opportunities operation that give us better safety. And yes, I need more data uh, for my systems in order to, um, you know, train up the mo models that we have. Uh, so, uh, you know, all of this, of course, is me just uh, speaking for the work of tremendously great students. Um, and I also want to thank students, Abe and Adam, for the footage from Skydio and, and been very fortunate to, to work with some, some great sponsors.